and she'll be followed by Lindsay Transu, uh, who works for the Northeast Fisheries Science Center's Passive Acoustics Group. I did get to talk to you all about right whale acoustics today, and I'd like to start by talking about what senses we would use if we were to start to try to live in the water full time. So as land-based mammals, uh, we have a variety of useful senses, but we're adapted to use sight as our primary means of gathering information. Sight has a lot of limitations in the water, however. First of all, we'd be limited to the surface layers of the ocean because light can only penetrate so far into the water column. We would be restricted to areas with good visibility, which would exclude us from a lot of nutrient-rich areas. And we'd be out of luck at night. Okay, so let's talk about scent. Since we breathe air, scent isn't going to give us a whole lot of information about our oceanic surroundings either. And then there's touch, which is really only useful in range of what you can reach, which in the vast ocean is not going to be a whole lot. So that leaves us with sound. Sound is actually advantageous in the water. It travels five times faster through water than it does through air, losing less energy over long distances and times. There's even a layer in the ocean that because of changing temperatures and pressures, essentially traps and rebounds sound for thousands of kilometers. Even with our air-based ears, we can hear pretty well in the water, but to take full advantage of the underwater acoustics, we would need time to adapt. And that's exactly what marine mammals have done. Baleen whales, like humpbacks, rights, and blues, have evolved to use low-frequency sound. So they don't echolocate or have high-pitched whistles like tooth whales do, but they do have calls that can travel ocean basins to communicate with other members of their population. The North Atlantic right whale has a few different types of calls. They have tonal calls that sound kind of like moans. They have an explosive gunshot sound, but they're best known for what's called an up call. Um, and so, for example, if I were to close my eyes and yell, Marco, what would you do? Polo. That's right. So you're responding polo gives me information on what direction you're in, what, how far away you are, maybe even how many of you there are, depending on how many polos I get back. That's exactly how right whales use the up call to keep track of each other. The up call is really low frequency. It goes from about 50 to 200 hertz, so kind of around the range of the low keys on a piano. Um, and. I can show you all on a spectrogram after this, but it looks kind of like a check mark. Um, and I'll just explain what a spectrogram is. Um, a spectrogram is a visual representation of a sound signal. So we use, uh, since we are sight-based mammals, we tend to use our eyes a lot. Um, and this helps us figure out which species are which. So um, on the x-axis for a spectrogram, you have time. On the y-axis, you have frequency, which we also commonly call pitch. Um, and then how strong a signal looks on that shows you how loud it is. So what's really cool about the right whale's up call is that the prevalence of it makes them very easy to study along their migration route. And that's exactly what I do. I'm an acoustic analyst with NOAA's Northeast Fisheries Science Center working to go through acoustic files and identify baleen whale calls and especially the right whale up calls. Oh, and I'm Lindsay Transu. <laughs> um, and this information allows us to determine when the right whales are in different areas, an idea of how long they're sticking around, and maybe even a little bit about their behavior while they're there. So I'll try not to talk about this for too long, but I do have a somewhat winding career pathway that led me here. So I'm originally from Knoxville, Tennessee, um, so a very landlocked place. Uh, but I have been obsessed with the ocean for as long as I can remember. And part of that is probably because my dad owns a business that installs, builds, and maintains small aquariums in people's homes and businesses. So I've grown up around these little aquarium systems. And my love of marine mammals may or may not have been influenced by my obsession with the movie Free Willy. <laughs> but regardless, um, uh, I got involved with these aquariums at a young age and started working with the family business. Uh, when my dad was injured in a car accident, it only made sense for me to take over more of that work. So I did that throughout high school. And thankfully, the University of Tennessee is also in Knoxville. So I was able to go to college there and stick around, help with the family business. And I double majored in ecology and kinesiology, which is also called exercise science. 
So kind of a weird combination, um, but I was hoping that ecology would one day be useful for a marine biology career. But realistically speaking, I was also always told, just like Jesse, that there's no money in marine biology. So um, I needed to make sure I was creating a way that I could help support my family if I needed to also. And kinesiology is one of the main pathways to physical therapy school, which at the time I thought could be a great option. So I got involved in an ecology lab in undergrad to get some research experience. But between my classes, working family business, working to support myself, nothing quite felt good. And I really couldn't figure out what I liked doing. So as my senior year rolled around, I needed to write an honors thesis and I decided to just stick to what I know best and write a business plan for expanding our family business. And that was what I was convinced I was gonna do. I worked with a business professor whose wife actually worked at a local aquarium and she encouraged me to apply for their scuba diver position so I could get some hands-on experience to how they do things. And this was a fantastic opportunity for me and it really inspired me to believe that I could and should be involved with the science working to understand and conserve marine animals in the wild. To do this, I felt like I needed just a little more science experience, so I applied to a general lab tech program at Oak Ridge National Lab, also near Knoxville. They have a lot of biological and ecological research, but I actually got selected for a position at the Spallation Neutron Source, mm -hmm. uh, which is an incredible instrument that you can use to tell chemical and even atomic structures of basically anything under different conditions. So through this work, I got to help support um, the research of visiting scientists from around the world. So after a few years of this work, saving up as much money as I could, and a very fortunate breakthrough of my dad's health care, I finally felt able to go to grad school, and that led me to College of Charleston. Um, College of Charleston is great for students like me who hadn't had marine research before. You get your first semester to go to seminars, see what's out there, meet with people. I went to an acoustic seminar and it had never occurred to me before that that I could do anything like that, but they were actually taking students at the time. And here I am now. <laughs> um, so for my thesis work, I conducted the first full soundscape analysis of Charleston Harbor. Um, and did anybody grow up watching The Little Mermaid? Okay, a few of you, well, even if you didn't, I hope you've heard the song Under the Sea where the fish and shrimp are singing because surprisingly, that's not too far off from reality. Uh, um, so we were able to learn a lot in Charleston Harbor from all the sound producing species, the snapping shrimp, the fish that we got to hear a little bit while we were in Charleston and the bottlenose dolphins. And we also had some really interesting results about how they were responding to boat noise in the harbor. So after I finished up this study last year, um, and I'll include this story too, I actually applied for a temporary fisheries job um, that was for data analysis. And I interviewed and I didn't have quite the statistical background they were looking for. Um, but when this job came available in the Passive Acoustic Research Group at NOAA's Northeast Fishery Science Center, uh, I got recommended by someone who was in that interview from before because I had talked about my acoustics experience. So you never know where rejection might take you. <laughs> um, and what I did in Charleston Harbor, so I'm relatively new, I started this job in October, um, but what I did in Charleston Harbor is called a passive acoustic monitoring study, which is exactly what we do in my group now. So for what I do involving long-term distribution and location-based management, passive acoustic monitoring gives us a larger time frame of analysis. We have continuous monitoring coverage, coverage, and we can also get a little bit of additional context about the boats and additional species that are around. There are a few advantages with this. We aren't limited by visibility, weather, time available on a boat or in the air. We're able to non-invasively monitor the, monitor the whales this way. And in the past, the huge volumes of data you get with this kind of work was inhibitory. There would be no way that we could go through every second of what we record manually. But now, thanks to advances in technology, we can use computer processing to automatically tag things that the computer thinks looks like whales, and then we go through and confirm what species it is and whether or not it was correct. So this allows us to go through really high volumes of data. 
However, if you wanted to know differences between individuals, get counts of how many whales were around, or understand more about uh, the whale's behavior, that's where the visual surveys really come in handy. And right, right whale conservation efforts over the last several decades have been primarily managed through visual survey efforts like we've just heard about from Amy. Um, these data come from decades of research that have been focused in areas the right whales are known to use. So the feeding grounds up in the northern areas and the calving grounds off the coast of Florida and Georgia. The general distribution of right whales seemed fairly well known, but there were a series of surprises in the 2010s that we've also heard about a little bit too. Um, so there was evidence of a potential mating ground going on in the Gulf of Maine in the winter. There were acoustic detections uh, and visual observation of whales in their historically recorded habitats off of Greenland and Iceland. There was year-round presence found in areas that were thought to be migratory corridors, and we even had those sporadic European sightings. These surprise findings indicate that there's still more to learn about their movements. Um, and they also pose a challenge for visual survey efforts since they span such a huge region. In addition to these surprises, there's been a noticeable shift in the distribution of right whales since 2010 in particular. So areas where right whales hang out like the Bay of Fundy, like we've heard about, and the Gulf of Maine have seen reduced numbers and visual surveys with whales shifting either north into the Gulf of St. Lawrence or further, further south into Cape Cod Bay, like we've heard about. And this poses a management challenge for mitigating the impacts of human threats to rights, right whales. And it's where passive acoustics come in to fill in these information gaps. So our group's been deploying recorders uh, in the Northwest Atlantic Ocean since 2004. We're going on 20 years of recording now. And in 2017, we were able to combine our acoustic recordings with those from uh, 19 other organizations in order to get a good picture of where the rails were across the Northwest Atlantic. We took all these recordings from all the organizations, ran them through our detector, and then manually verified whenever the whales were present. And this allowed us to get a little more information on these shifting patterns. We found that first of all, not all whales are migrating. So there was nearly continuous year-round presence of right whales across their entire habitat range, but particularly north of Cape Hatteras. And second, right whales appear to have shifted from those northern grounds like we talked about to spend more, more time in the mid-Atlantic and the southern New England regions. It's been unclear whether these distribution shifts are due to environmental or anthropogenic effects, if they're long-term or if they're short-term patterns. But studies have found that the Gulf of Maine is one of the fastest warming bodies of water in the world. So it's not surprising that we're seeing shifts and it is likely due to shifts in what they're eating. It's likely that we'll have more and more of these changes too as warming continues um, and the whales will be pushed towards better areas with better oceanic conditions or food sources. So even though we've seen shifting patterns in the greater region, the Gulf of Maine is a particular area of interest due to the possibility of overlap with fisheries and potential offshore wind energy development. So this region is my particular area of focus. I'm currently analyzing all the Gulf of Maine recorders for right whale presence. And there was actually not a lot of acoustic coverage till recently. So in 2020, we got a bunch of recorders out on the coastal Gulf of Maine. Um, and then in 2022, we were able to add an array of hydrophones in the offshore area. In the coastal area, um, it is infrequent, but we do occasionally find up calls confirming right whale presence in that area, which is really important to know for an area that is covered with gear. The offshore ones just went out in May last year, um, and these have by far been my favorite deployments to go through because we had days upon days of continuous up calls in late May, early June. So they're definitely hanging out in that area. And like Amy said, just maybe a little further offshore. So one downside to these long-term distribution studies is that we have a delay between when we record the sounds and when we have the full information. So these deployments often go out for four to six months at a time. <laughs> they record, we get it back, we have to download, someone like me analyzes it, and then it all has to be pulled together to see the big picture. Ooh. <laughs> 
So in addition to these long-term studies, we also use some real-time monitoring um, with buoys and gliders. So these moorings are able to record and process audio in real time, and these were all created in collaboration with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. They run from Savannah all the way up to Canada in various places, and uh, a variety of research partners um, operate those. So we operate a glider that operate, <laughs> operates off the coast of New England, um, and in, over the past few years, any real-time detections of right whales have been able to implement slow zones in those areas. There's a website called Robot for Whales 2 that you can, um, you can go to check out all the recent sightings of, uh, well, not sightings, what's been heard. So overall, right whales have high mobility and a broad potential range. Using passive acoustics, we've been able to use the right whale up call to verify and extend the range of visual detections, to identify both seasonal and long-term distribution patterns, and to implement slow zones in real time. This can help us adapt management strategies as the right whales encounter new threats as they move to areas outside of current management areas. So uh, continuing to monitor this way will allow us to fill in information gaps to provide the best available information on right whales. Um, oh, and I will talk about, I have not yet seen a right whale, sadly, so fingers crossed for this trip, but um, I will say the first time I came across a true up call in the coastal Gulf of Maine was probably my favorite because we went, I was going through months and months of nothing and nothing and nothing and then found a few days of just these beautiful up calls. I'll have to play them for y'all in the lab. Their up calls are so fun. So, so that's all I have and I'd love to know if anyone has any questions.